right. So firstly, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm uh, glad to see you all here. This is going to be a beautiful evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Joel Briere, and I am the founder of Kaivalia Collective and the founder of Tandava Retreats and co-founder of Five. And uh, we are here in Tepoztlan, Mexico, uh, right near the Tandava Retreat Center. And, you know, our everything we've been doing is all around safe and effective use of 5-MeO-DMT. We come from the underground. We come from being in service to this beautiful molecule. And it's really been our mission to help shepherd this molecule out into the public in a safe and effective way, because as we all know, it's gotten a little crazy out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Victoria, how about you? Yeah, for those of you who don't, don't know me, my name is Victoria, and I am the Director of Education for Cavalier Collective, uh, co-founder for and uh, co-founder and president for FIVE, which stands for Five Amino DMT Information and Vital Education. And for those of you who haven't been to the FIVE site yet, this is essentially a free harm reduction Five Amino DMT resource that was created by the community for the public. And our main kind of mission with this is really giving people who want to learn more about this medicine and people who are looking to maybe work with it, giving them all the tools necessary to responsibly approach this medicine. And uh, yeah, we'll be leaving the link to the FIVE website website in the comments below. Yeah. yeah. And uh, other than that, you know, we're going to have a Q and A at the end. So if you have questions that come up, there is a little Q and A button down at the bottom and you can just throw your questions in there and we will uh, go through the questions at the end and uh, get a few out there. And obviously please leave your questions and comments uh, respectful. And uh, let's remember, we're all part of a big, beautiful community and we're looking forward to growing together. And uh, without further ado, why don't you introduce yes. Mr. Hamilton? I think probably everybody already knows who Hamilton is, but in case somebody here doesn't know, um, Hamilton Morris is a chemist, documentarian, a science journalist, and a science journalist. Hamilton Morris works as a medicinal chemist at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and he is the writer and director of the documentary series Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, where he explored the chemistry and traditions surrounding psychoactive drugs. His research has allowed him to study psychoactive plants, fungi, and chemicals, as well as the culture that surrounds them in more than 30 countries using an interdisciplinary approach. His recent, his recent republishing of a book uh, a book on Buffalo Various has, at the time of writing, raised more than 250000 for basic research on Parkinson's disease. Woo-woo, that's amazing. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you so much, Hamilton, for joining us. I'm so looking forward to hearing all the wisdom you have to share with us, and I know everyone else here is too, so I'll uh, let you take it away. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, with things like this, I'm always a little bit unsure how deep to go or what the appropriate level of sophistication is. So I'm gonna start with the most basic stuff and then I'm gonna get into some more technical stuff, but I'm gonna do a screen share and let me see if I can pull up this. Okay, all right and play. Okay, so this, everyone can see this, molecular diagram yeah all right very good okay so this is the structure of 5-MeO DMT it's unfortunate that 5-MeO DMT is named 5-MeO DMT because it is probably the most confusing name it could have people don't like the name it's annoying to say so they abbreviate it in various ways sometimes they call it 5 sometimes they call it 5-MeO sometimes they call it DMT and I understand why people might want to use those sorts of abbreviations, but the problem is that it introduces a lot of very real ambiguity because five could be a number of different things. Five MEO could be any five methoxytryptamine, of which there are many. And depending on where you are in the world, five MEO DMT may not even be the most prominent five MEO tryptamine. For example, in Japan, 5-MeO-DIPT was a very popular drug, far, far, far more popular than 5-MeO-DMT. So you could be talking about 5-MeO in Japan, and people might think you're talking about a completely different drug. Obviously, this is a sort of unusual scenario, but the point is that if you just call something 5-MeO, there is a lot of ambiguity. I mean, there's a lot of different drugs that have a 5-methoxy group, so that, I think, lacks a certain chemical specificity. Calling it DMT is even worse because DMT is an entirely different drug. So if you call 5-MeO DMT DMT, then people may think you're talking about an entirely different drug 
And that's a real problem because there are major chemical, pharmacological, and experiential differences between 5-MeO-DMT and DMT, despite them both having DMT in their names. And this has been a, a huge pain for me because when I was making the third season of my show, I wanted to synthesize an enormous quantity of 5-MeO-DMT in a lab in Mexico because 5-MeO-DMT is not a controlled substance in Mexico. But the legal team in the United States said, well, it's DMT, right? It's, it has DMT in its name. And I'd say, yes, it does have DMT in its name, but just because it has DMT in its name doesn't mean that it is DMT. And they'd say, well, how is it not DMT if it has DMT in its name? And this is something that makes sense to a chemist, but is hard to grasp for people who are not thinking about the ways that molecules are structured and named. You could call 5-MeO-DMT a number of different things. For example, you could call 5-MeO-DMT NNO trimethyl serotonin. That's another perfectly valid name for it, and it doesn't contain DMT. So this is, this is kind of the, the problem with these sorts of names. To make things even worse, people will sometimes differentiate between 5-MeO-DMT and DMT by calling DMT NNDMT. But the problem with doing that is that both 5-MeO-DMT and NNDMT are NNDMTs. So this is a this is a sort of complicated point. I wish I had a laser pointer or something here so that I could uh, better explain why that is the case. But if you look at this diagram carefully, you see there's an N. The N stands for nitrogen. There are two different Ns in the structure. Now, usually when people are talking, in fact, always when people are talking about an N substitution, they're only talking about the nitrogen that's located at the top of the diagram, not the one at the bottom. That one is technically referred to as the one position. So if you were putting a methyl group or something there, it would be called one methyl DMT, or there's even a DMT derivative present in the plant Lespedisa bicolor called one methoxy DMT. And it has a trivial name, Lespedamine. It's really the actual issue is it's unfortunate that 5-MeO-DMT didn't get a trivial name, but this is, uh, this is what happened. So if you look here, you can see the comparison structurally of a lot of these so-called simple tryptamines. Simple tryptamine is another chemically imprecise term that people use for these sorts of basic structurally non-complex tryptamines that are found often in nature, but not always. And these are the major ones that are used by humans as psychedelics. So to the leftmost upper corner, you have DMT found in Psychotria viridis or Mimosa hostilis. It is the major psychedelic component of the South American ayahuasca brew. It is also extracted from plants or synthesized and smoked, or it can be injected. And in some ways, I think it represents the prototypical classical psychedelic drug. Then you have 5-hydroxy DMT or bufotenine. Again, really unfortunate that that one got the name bufotenine because uh, everyone thinks because it's called bufotenine that it must be derived from toads. And it is. It was initially found in the common European toad bufo bufo, but nobody really seems to use it in as a psychedelic uh in its toad derived form or the evidence for it is pretty shaky i would say in contrast to that there is a lot of evidence for the use of bufotenine containing seeds from the south american tree anadenanthra colubrina that is arguably in terms of the archaeological record one of the best supported instances of human use of psychedelics there are thousands of snuff tubes and various trays and implements for the traditional use of anadenanthra colubrina seeds that have been found at archaeological sites around South America. So this was once an extremely prominent psychedelic drug. In fact, a, a totally evidence-based argument can be made that this is the psychedelic with the longest history of human use, yet in the 21st century, nobody talks about bufotenine anymore. It has basically disappeared from our psychedelic lexicon. And the reason for that is that bufotenine historically was thought to be completely inactive. Even Alexander Shulgin himself, who was, you know, the, the greatest expert to ever live on this subject, was 
confused by the conflicting reports and was never able to solve this issue of bufotenine's activity on his own. It wasn't until Jonathan Ott, another researcher, isolated bufotenine and conducted a, a series of self-experiments that he was able to definitively identify bufotenine as a psychedelic. Previously, many people thought that it couldn't enter the brain because it was too polar, but this was just a really in interesting instance of something that all it really took was someone isolating it and taking it to solve this mystery that had been waged in the scientific literature and argued about for years and years and years. Um, then you have psilocybin, which is actually not an active psychedelic on its own, but after it is ingested, it's converted to another drug called psilocin that is a very potent psychedelic that could also be called 4-hydroxy-DMT if you wanted to. So again, this is another instance where the molecule was lucky enough to get a trivial name that spared it from this confusion with its relationship with DMT. Because if you notice here, all of these substances, are they're all DMTs. They all have two methyl groups on the basic nitrogen. Okay, then there is fibromo-DMT, which is the only psychedelic which has ever been isolated from a marine organism and only a marine organism. So this is uh, never actually extracted from sponges, thankfully, although it is found in a sponge species called Spenospongia aurea, but it is occasionally synthesized. I've synthesized it myself. It's a relatively easy drug to synthesize, although it doesn't have very dramatic psychedelic activity, it is active as a psychedelic. Then there is 5-MeO-DMT, which could also be called O-methyl bufotenine or any number of other things. And it is found in the venom or the secretions of the toad bufo or Ancilius alvarius. It's also found in some plants, but unfortunately, it tends to be the case that the plant sources are either mixtures of different tryptamines. For example, there are other species in the genus Anadenanthera that produce 5-MeO-DMT, but it's in a mixture with bufotenine. And, uh, and I should say, as, I, I, as I said earlier, nobody really talks about bufotenine. Bufotenine is a, a drug that I have tried. I have tried uh, isolated pure bufotenine, and it is a psychedelic that is both pharmacologically and experientially and chemically intermediate between DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. So it has a longer duration than actually both 5-MeO-DMT and DMT, but it is far less visual than 5-MeO-DMT, but far more visual than, uh, it's, it's yet yeah, less visual than DMT, but more visual than 5-MeO-DMT. So it's kind of like in between the two. It's also very nauseating, which is the main reason that people seem not to enjoy it very much. But it, it is a, you know, a classical psychedelic drug that produces visionary effects. And Jonathan Odd actually liked the effect of it quite a bit. Okay, so the, and I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground here. So uh, I'm going to be uh, moving through a couple of things. Okay, so you know, I'm sure most of the people listening to this are familiar with the etymology of the word psychedelic. It means mind manifesting. Unfortunately, that is a word that doesn't really have that much explanatory value. Like, what does mind manifesting mean? Is my mind not manifesting right now? It could refer to almost anything. So you can use the word psychedelic to describe all sorts of different things. And it's routinely used for all kinds of chemically and pharmacologically unrelated substances. People will call nitrous oxide a psychedelic. It's an NMDA antagonist. People will call ketamine a psychedelic. It is also an NMDA antagonist. People will call muscimol from Amanita muscaria mushrooms a psychedelic. It's a GABA A agonist. People will call atropine or scopolamine from various delirium plants psychedelics. These are anticholinergics. People will refer to cannabis as a psychedelic. These are, C, you know, THC is a CB1 agonist and on and on and on and on. There's a lot of things that can be called psychedelic, even uh, carbon dioxide under some circumstances. And yet these are different compounds. There's a, a specific subset of these psychedelics that are sometimes called classical psychedelics that exert their effect primarily through serotonin receptors. And the classical psychedelics are things like LSD, DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, 2-CB, mescaline, and so on. 
even within those, there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of their receptor interactions. For example, LSD binds to a variety of different dopamine receptors. And although we typically talk about 5-HT2A as the receptor that is responsible for the classical psychedelic effect, the reality is that these drugs often bind to 5-HT2B, 5-HT2C, various subtypes of 5-HT1 receptors that will exert modulatory effects on the experience in addition to uh, transporter proteins and who knows what other receptors. Okay. But the two that I think are really most important for understanding the activity of these so-called classical psychedelics are the 5-HT1A receptor and the 5-HT2A receptor. And even within this, this somewhat specific umbrella of classical psychedelics, you have what I think of is almost two experientially and pharmacologically distinct classes of drugs. The 5-HT2A agonists are loosely speaking what people think of when they think of a classical psychedelic experience. Uh, geometric visual hallucinations or distortions, visionary effects, increased awareness of your environment, um, a sort of wakefulness and awareness. These are the things that people associate with a 2A agonist. The 1A agonists often do not produce visual distortions. They often produce anterograde amnesia they can cause users to lose all awareness of their environment entirely, acting almost more like an anesthetic in some regards. So these are substances that behave very, very, very differently, despite still falling under this umbrella of a classical psychedelic. And the reality is that many of the classical psychedelics bind to both receptors. For example, psilocin binds to both 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A. The phenethylamines tend to have a reduced interaction with 5-HT1A receptors. Um, and some of these substances, you can actually increase the psychedelic activity by blocking their interaction with 5-HT1A receptors, which is really kind of unexpected. You'd think, okay, if if 5-HT1A is a component of the pharmacology of all these substances, clearly it must be part of what gives them their psychedelic activity. But in some instances, for example, the morpholine derivative of LSD, LSM-775, if you co-administer a drug that blocks the 5-HT1A receptor, it becomes more psychedelic in rodents. And Rick Strassman actually did a similar study with DMT where he co-administered a 5-HT1A antagonist called Pindolol that was developed in the lab of Albert Hoffman, actually, as a result of his work with psilocin. And he found that the co-administration of the 1A antagonist made DMT more psychedelic. So this is sort of paradoxical. You would think that blocking this receptor would make it less psychedelic, but it seems that 1A can actually dampen the activity of certain 2A agonists. So this brings us to 5-MeO-DMT which has, depending on what studies you look at, about 300-fold selectivity for 5-HT1A over 5-HT2A. It is a psychedelic that is very much oriented toward 1A in its activity. So I think you can learn a little bit about 5-MeO-DMT from looking at pharmacologically related substances, which will give you some kind of weird insight into the activity of this particular substance. Now, these are not going to be reports that uh, make these drugs look good. In fact, these reports all make these substances look kind of terrible. But I think that this introduces uh, some interesting dimensions to the psychopharmacology of 5-MeO-DMT. Okay, so this is the most potent known 5-HT1A agonist, which was synthesized by a chemist named Eros Laban at the lab of David E. Nichols at Purdue University. So this binds to the 5-HT1A receptor with 0.12 nanomolar activity. So it's incredibly, incredibly potent and also very difficult to synthesize. So Eros Slavon synthesized this stuff. He spent six months working on it. And then he was washing up all the glassware. He saw a filter paper that had a little bit of residue of this chemical on it. And he thought, uh, well, I spent six months making it. I might as well lick the filter paper just to, you know, I can't let it go to waste was his thinking. So he took less than a milligram. This is just a few micrograms. And 
Thankfully, he only had a threshold effect, but this is a, a report that from an interview on my podcast where he described his experience taking it. So he found it uh, unpleasant. Here's another report. This is a lesser known substance, 5-MeO-DET. Like 5-MeO-DMT, 5-MeO-DET binds preferentially to 5-HT1A receptors. So somebody... This is a report from Arrowwood. Somebody insufflated a 50 milligram dose. This is actually after taking 5-MeO-DIPT. So this should be uh, understood with that confounding factor. But this person describes um, snorting 50 milligrams, basically experiencing amnesia, walking outside of the environment that they're in, having a sort of transcendent, very positive experience, coming back four hours later, and their friends are extremely worried about them. So there's a sort of amnesia, there's disinhibition, and there's a sort of uh, transcendent effect that is described. Shulgin also worked with this compound, and he described dizziness, weakness, cramps, uh, really negative activity primarily, and even described it later in his commentary as a torture psychedelic. These were the, the the terms, a torture psychedelic. This was actually recently one of the five tryptamines that the DEA was attempting to prohibit this year. And thankfully, they did not succeed because even if it is not a enjoyable drug or a drug of abuse, it's very useful for scientific research. Okay. Then there is 5-MeO-pyrrolidine tryptamine. This is an especially interesting compound. Also, it was first investigated in the lab of David Nichols at Purdue University. And there are a number of experience reports that are published on this compound in Tikal. People describe vomiting, they describe amnesia. And most notably, one of the students in the lab of David Nichols named Robert Oberlander actually smoked this compound and stripped nude, walked around Lafayette, was arrested, and woke up in a jail cell with a blanket over him feeling better than he'd ever felt in his life. So again, we have amnesia, disinhibition, leaving the environment, and a sort of transcendent experience that can't be remembered very well by the user of the substance. This was a very positive experience for Robert Oberlander, but it resulted in him being kicked out of the lab of David Nichols. And it was actually a very dangerous thing to do. So, okay. And then another report on a similar compound where the description is kind of negative, feelings of numbness in the extremities, paresthesia, accelerated heart rate, um, feeling hungry but unable to eat, nauseous but unable to vomit. And this all sounds very negative. So this this is sort of what you see with a lot of these here, I'm going to go back out of the screen share for a moment. Let me see if I can. Uh... Oh, well, maybe not. Well, maybe I'll just stay in the screen share then. Um, so this is what you see with a lot of the 5-HT1A agonists. Amnesia, disinhibition, nausea, dysphoria, and then sometimes this transcendent experience that emerges out of nowhere, which is really remarkable given that 5-MeO-DMT has such positive effects in a lot of people. So the question is, why? Oh, here, I think I can do it. Okay. Is, am I back? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the question is, given that all these, and I know I, I just shared all these really negative experiences, but I, I think it's useful to contextualize the activity of 5-MeO-DMT with related compounds that have similar activity at 5-HT1A receptors, because you don't typically see that. So why is it that anyone likes 5-MeO-DMT if it has all of these horrendous, if these similar compounds have all these horrendously negative and frightening effects? And the answer is that 5-MeO-DMT, I think, actually does have the capacity to exert those sorts of effects, and some people experience them. There's a, a term that's sometimes used called the dreaded underdose, which is you take a dose that is high enough that you feel the activity, but not so high that you transcend and exit your environment. And for some people, myself included, that can be immensely frightening. It can feel like just essentially like being poisoned, but what is amazing about 5-MeO-DMT is if you exit that level and you enter a higher level, you basically leave all these negative effects 
behind and have an experience that I think is very dissimilar from a classical psychedelic experience. Um, instead of, you know, when I think of a classical psychedelic experience, there might be, um, you know, awareness of your own mortality, thoughts about your parents and how much you love them, the people that you love, that you care about, your motivations, your goals in life, whatever. In a 5-MeO DMT experience, there can be a complete absence of content, a complete whiting out, essentially a loss of consciousness that you emerge from with a ineffable sense of gratitude that you are alive. And I have reviewed footage of myself in that state for 10 minutes. I'm just unresponsive to my environment, periodically saying the word love. But other than that, there is nothing happening. So... I think what makes 5-MeO-DMT so valuable is that it is able to be used at a high enough dose that you can reach that transcendent effect, but come back within 10 to 15 minutes. Whereas these other substances like 5 meo proline tryptamine that resulted in Robert Oberlander's arrest have multi-hour durations. And what happens is eventually people get up, they start walking around, they start doing things, and they get into horrible trouble. This is not to say that 5-MeO-DMT is without those same sorts of risks. It absolutely is. It just is relatively safe compared to many of these other 5-HT1A agonist psychedelics, where they can cause something resembling a dissociative fugue state. So this brings me to the risks with 5-MeO-DMT. Um, and unlike psilocin and psilocybin and DMT and mescaline and LSD, where you essentially don't have any instances of people dying using these substances, I mean, it does, you know, if you include so-called behavioral toxicity, like people jumping off bridges or out windows, sure. But in terms of the direct pharmacological effects, these don't really seem to be drugs that can kill people. 5-MeO-DMT uh, has a couple of additional risks that are not present with these other substances. One is that it is not, it is orally active, although it takes sort of higher doses. Most people don't use it orally. It's also sublingually active. It can also be snorted. It can be used in a, a variety of different ways, but um, the, the lower oral activity has tempted some people to combine it with an MAOI, which is very dangerous. So MAOIs do potentiate the activity of 5-MeO-DMT. This is a drug that is metabolized by MAO. So when you combine it with an MAOI, you essentially transform it into one of these other substances that I described, where the duration is extended, you have increased risk of who knows what, you know, serotonin syndrome is kind of a nebulous clinical entity, but maybe something in that, uh, in that general vicinity of symptoms, vomiting, hyperthermia, right? It hasn't been studied all that well. But what you often find more than anything is people who vomit and choke on their vomit or other types of behavioral toxicity. So some of you may be aware of uh, Casey Hardison. He was a LSD chemist, a very prominent LSD chemist and a friend of mine. He had a really horrible thing happen to him that was really traumatic. And, you know, I've heard people talk about it, sometimes criticizing Casey. I think it's very, very unfair because, um, you know, I think it was a really, probably a, a really painful thing for him to endure. And what happened for those that aren't familiar with the story is that him and a friend had been drinking and they both decided that they were going to smoke 5-MeO-DMT while they were drunk. And they decided they were going to do it at the same time. And they both smoked 5-MeO-DMT. They came to, or Casey came to, and his friend had vomited and had died while Casey was under the influence of the 5-MeO-DMT. So there's a lot to learn from that experience. One is never do it without somebody watching you, without a sober sitter who's there to ensure that if anything happens, they can care for you. Never do it when you're intoxicated on alcohol or any other drugs. It's too profound and intensive an experience to use impulsively like that. Now, Casey was a really smart guy, is a really smart guy. And he probably felt that he'd done so many psychedelics and was so familiar that the rules didn't apply to him. And that's a very easy trap to fall into. People do that sort of thing all the time. They say, oh, of course you don't drive when you're under the influence of psychedelics. That That's most people, but I'm 
I am so experienced and so knowledgeable that the rules don't apply to me. It's important to remember these rules apply to everyone. Nobody is so advanced in their psychedelic exploration that they don't need to be observed and they don't need to exert these basic cautionary steps when they use the substance. And the other thing that happened that uh, people should be aware of is there was a um, there was somebody who died recently from a fire while they were smoking 5-MeO-DMT. So if you're smoking this by yourself um, and you don't have somebody that you can hand a pipe to, you could burn yourself with the pipe, you could burn yourself with the lighter, or as happened to this person, you could start a fire and you would be unaware because you're unaware of your environment when under the influence of this substance. So this person actually died in a fire caused presumably by some implement related to the smoking of the 5-MeO-DMT and they were unresponsive because they were under the influence of the drug. So these are really tragic things that are avoidable if people take basic cautionary steps. In terms of the vomiting, the easiest and best way to prevent that is by fasting. So this is something that is routinely done before surgical procedures because anesthesiologists recognize that it's immensely dangerous to vomit when you're unconscious. And so they take proactive steps to prevent that vomiting from occurring. And the easiest way to reduce the risk of choking on vomit is to fast before the experience. So that's a simple one. There are also antiemetics that can be co-administered with the 5-MeO-DMT, but I think it's, it's probably easiest and safest to just go with fasting. Um, those are the major cautionary. I mean, I, I guess I can also get into the, the issue of abuse in some of these things, but I'm not really an expert on that. And it's, it's hard because when I was making my TV show, I would often interview people and I would get all these responses because people from different sides wanted me to present different dimensions of the picture. So for example, I interviewed this guy, Dr. Jerry, Jerry Sandoval. And I remember when the piece was released, all these people started attacking me and they were saying, how could you show him using 5-MeO-DMT in an unsafe way? Don't you realize that that looks bad? Don't you realize that you're showing something that is unsafe? And I would think when I got these criticisms, well, yeah, that's the point. The whole point was not to create an advertisement. The point was to show the reality of how these things are used, including the dangerous dimensions of how they're used so that people can see for themselves, because I think that that is valuable information to present. Then I started getting attacked from the opposing position, which was, you didn't make Jerry look bad enough. How, how could you have possibly shown him looking like a good guy when in fact he is this diabolical abuser? Now, I don't have any firsthand experience with his abuse. My personal interactions with him were all positive and constructive and good, but I have heard that people have had very negative experiences with both him and Octavio Reddig. And the typical community reaction is to shame these people and say, oh, they're terrible. We've got to talk about how bad they are. Okay, sure. We can talk about how bad they are. But I think a more constructive thing to do is to make people generally cautious of this world as much as possible and to not approach it with blind trust that just because somebody does this, that they are a good person or they have your best interests in mind. And I wish I had a simple thing that I could tell people and say, oh, you know, here's a person you go to and they're totally good. They're safe. I don't, I'm not able to provide that kind of help to people because I don't know. And in my own experience, I have always favored use of these substances with a trusted friend when at all possible, because I think it's often the case that a trusted friend is depending on what your friend group is like. Okay. So I, maybe this doesn't apply to everyone, but uh, I think a, you know, a trusted friend is someone who you can share your experience with someone who you already know has your best interest in mind. doesn't have the same, uh, same uncertainties associated with doing it with a stranger. But I understand that for many people, there's a lot of different reasons that they go to these clinics and retreats. And it's, I don't have a simple explanation other than be cautious and be aware of these issues because they're, it's not just Octavio Reddick or Jerry Sandoval. These are issues that will always exist. And it's unfortunately going to be people's responsibilities to approach these substances with as much caution as possible. Um, 
And as these things move toward a more regulated industry, and maybe even as approved medicines, maybe that will make some things easier for some people, but these risks will never go away entirely. Um, it's just one of the kind of complexities of using psychedelics in that sort of an environment where you're in the presence of a complete stranger. Um, I can also talk about some of the ecological bufo alvarius dimensions because you know that that has been a, a major focus of the work that i was doing so i think i have 10 minutes left right okay um so when i was making these two pieces about bufo alvarius i was really interested in this basic historical question of where did this practice come from people like Jerry Sandoval and Octavio Reddick were very interested in constructing an indigenous history of the use. And they, I think, felt that from an op the optics of indigenous or traditional use were better than, than the reality, which was that it was discovered by a guy in Texas in the 80s. So that is the current that is the current state of affairs when it comes to historical understanding of 5-MeO-DMT. There was a man named Ken Nelson, who is just a kind of brilliant, nerdy guy who was reading scientific literature about 5-MeO-DMT. He was also reading this magazine, Omni. He found a report of a Cherokee midden pile that contained a lot of toad bones that were thought to be a remnant from some kind of psychoactive toad tradition. As it turns out, um, these were toads that had been used as a food source. This was nowhere near the geographical region of Bufo alvarius, and it has been subsequently confirmed that there is a tradition of eating toads in that region. So uh, this is not evidence of ancient toad use, but what was interesting is he still, even though that original analysis was wrong, he still followed up on it and tried to discover it for himself, not realizing that he was essentially creating the tradition that he was hoping to emulate. Very unusual scenario. And uh, and he smoked this stuff and he wrote this beautiful book about it, which I republished here, that, um, you know, was, was this amazingly erudite, beautifully crafted book that really stood the test of time. Everything that he wrote in that book is still very true today. And, um, and so I went about this task of trying to find him and had this bizarre experience where uh, a there's a really brilliant guy named Keeper Trout. He's kind of an expert on tryptamines. And he had been really helpful on my show. He would um, work with a producer named Justin Clark. And he had told Justin that the book was written by this guy, Alfred Savinelli, that Alfred Savinelli had told him that he wrote the book. So Justin said, we should check out this guy, Savinelli. He seems like the guy. So we start looking into Savinelli and he ticks all the boxes. He was uh, on a National Geographic TV show as a toad expert introducing Henry Rollins to 5-MeO-DMT. He was um, like a sort of psychedelic elder who had been responsible for supplying William Leonard Picard's LSD lab with glassware and solvents and was embroiled in that whole scandal. And he was a really smart, interesting guy. So. And on top of that, I knew one fact about the author of the book, which is that he was a participant in Rick Strassman's DMT studies. And Alfred Savinelli was a participant in those studies, which only had maybe 20 participants. So it all lined up. What are the chances that this is not the guy? Like one in a million. So I interview Savinelli. He he talks about the book and and writing it, but there's something a little off about it, but there's something a little off about a lot of things. And so I didn't, I, it wasn't enough for me to say, wait a second, there's something really wrong with this. So I released the piece and then I start getting messages from people. And one person said, you know, I watched your episode. I really liked it, but there's something wrong because uh, I was really good friends with the guy that wrote that book. His name was Ken. And, uh, and I don't know who the guy is that's claiming to have written it, but it's not Ken. And, uh, and then someone else writes me the same thing. Like, you know, I actually know the guy who wrote the book. It was in Texas in the 80s. His name was Ken. I don't know who this other guy is, but it's not Ken. Okay. So then I realized I have been tricked or something. Something weird has happened. And uh, and it puts me in a weird position because I really like Alfred Savinelli and I didn't want to publicly like call him a liar. Um, 
<laughs> because it's I, it's just mean. It's not it's not a fun thing to do. So I had scripted this entire basically joke sequence where um, I was going to you know be in a bar. I don't drink, but I was going to be in a bar. And then the show was going to come on and I'd see Savinelli and I'd say, oh, that liar, I'm going to get him. And I'd like break a beer bottle. And, uh, and then there'd be like a travel montage of me, you know, in a plane with the beer bottle driving across the country with the beer bottle. And then I go to his house and knock on the door and I say, like, how could you lie to me? And he says, oh, I was just fucking with you. And, uh, and then it's like anticlimactic. That was going to be the joke. But he didn't want to participate in any of this. So then it put me in a weird position where he didn't want to acknowledge it. I was like trying to explain to him that this would lay, this would take the pressure off because it would then make me look like a fool as opposed to him. But, um, but he didn't want to do it. And then I released, I instead wrote this like Howard Hughes sequence instead as a way to try to correct it. And, uh, and then released it. Then Savinelli got insanely angry at me, even though I had gone to all of this and was just, you know, calling me, uh, on Christmas, threatening me, you know, threatening me for threatening me for a long time, very, very angry. And I feel bad about that. And, um, and then it resulted in this insane article being written where people were saying that he had done it, like this guy, Eric Davis wrote this insane thing saying, Eric Davis, who was actually one of the original sources that Savinelli was lying. So then he wrote an article saying he wasn't lying. It, the whole thing was like a, a mess. Like, I cannot believe how much insanity came out of this in addition to $250,000 for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, because Ken Nelson, the person that wrote it had Parkinson's disease. So really, I mean, that's just skimming the surface of the insanity that came out of this whole thing. And then on top of that, then there was this uh, whole kind of crisis about the ecological responsibility of harvesting toad venom and um, and this debate about, well, you know, what is the difference? And there's got to be a difference. And, and uh, you know, my my take on it is that if there is a difference, the difference is undesirable, right? It's like you have increased variation in dosage, which really matters with a drug that is this potent. 5-MeO-DMT is the most potent naturally occurring serotonergic psychedelic. And so if you are dealing with samples that might be double the potency, which has been observed in the sparse analytical literature that has been published, you see 100-fold uh or 100% variation. So that means like you could be giving double the dose to somebody not realizing it, depending on what toad it came from. And that is something you really want to avoid with all of the uncertainty that is inherent in a psychedelic experience. If you can at least ensure that the dosage and identity of the substance that are being consumed are consistent, you are eliminating one variable that will make things so much safer for people. And it also, if you're a practitioner, it will make things much safer because it will allow you to make evidence-based observations about the way people respond to the drug. So for example, if you give it to a smaller person and you know they respond very strongly to 15 milligrams, you can note that and you can say, okay, next time give them 10 milligrams because you actually know how much they, uh, how much they consume. So this is just a very basic, easy, intervention that I think really has a will pay dividends in terms of the safety of users. Um, the other thing is that the natural material is basically just 5-MeO-DMT. It contains a trace amount of bufotenine. But as I said earlier, bufotenine is not really a desirable substance to begin with. It's way less potent than 5-MeO-DMT. So I don't think it's even contributing psychopharmacologically to the experience of the smoked venom. And again, people say, well, I heard someone say that there is a difference. Well, that's fine. I mean, people say lots of stuff. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Like people say that LSD in different crystal polymorphs is completely different qualitatively, or people will say all kinds of stuff. And that is because there's an immense psychological component to these experiences. I'm not saying that the experience isn't different, but if I give someone 5-MeO-DMT and I say, oh, this came from a sacred toad that was cultivated for 10 generations by a family that prayed for the toad every day and, and fanned it and gave it the most delicious flies to eat, and uh, and then I say, oh, and this this was you know made in a this is five MeO DMT that was made in a toilet uh, by an angry <laughs> by an angry bad man somewhere. <laughs> like it could be the exact same chemical, but people will probably have different experiences based on the psychological priming that is inherent in the way that the substance is presented. And for people that have 
uh, spiritual leanings, that is extremely, extremely important, that kind of psychological priming and how that will impact the nature of the experience. But chemically speaking, there is essentially no difference. And the really funny thing, I don't know if people here already know this, is that there was a, a company in Chicago that tried to sort of solve this problem by create, they did surgery on a toad, removed cells from its gland, then created a culture of those cells so that they could produce 5-MeO-DMT naturally from toad cells, but without harvesting it from toads, except for that initial cell harvest from the gland. And they and recently published the results of their work. And what I thought was really funny is that it was indistinguishable from synthetic 5-MeO-DMT. I thought that the whole point of this would be that it would contain, because there are other things. There's steroids that are present in the venom. Um, there's a number of, of things that are very, very unlikely to modulate the activity, but they're there. There's other stuff there. So I thought there would be that other stuff as well, but there wasn't. It was basically just a biosynthetic 5-MeO-DMT manufacturing process, which is cool. And maybe for some people that, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, synthetic meat or other things, you know, there's a market for it. People will, will like that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hamilton. That was great. That was great. I, uh, I have a special appreciation for what you said around the lament that they named it 5-MeO-DMT. If they would have given it another name, it would have saved us tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees down here in Mexico <laughs> trying to make it all make sense. <laughs> and, uh, oh my God. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, I, I think you, there's no reason you can't call it trimethyl serotonin. Yeah. It's chemically accurate. So maybe that's the solution to all of these problems. I love it. I love it. All right. We're, we're going to propose this to, to just the world. <laughs> Be like, all right, we're changing the name. All right. So let's get a couple of questions. Uh, there's, one that I just wanted to uh, to address real quick, and then actually I'll um, we'll speak on very quickly, and then um, open it up to you, Hamilton, um, from Mr. Ryan Patrine, saying I hear so many practitioners saying that a standard responsible dose of Bufo is for someone who passes pre-screening psychological and health issues should be only between sixty and eighty milligrams. I strongly disagree. Isn't it better logically to serve a higher dose, i.e., a hundred milligrams baseline, ensuring we achieve the full ego dissolution and non-dual states? rather than run the risk of underdosing someone. I dose 120 to 200 milligrams very intentionally every three months. I've served 100 milligram processes over 500 times with great success. Uh, dear brother Ryan, um, so one of the main reasons why you hear that um, sensible doses between 60 and 80, and I wouldn't even say 60 and 80, uh, I would say many practitioners do achieve full releases with their participants with doses starting at 40 milligrams to 60 milligrams. And there is a extremely strong connection um, and correlation between amount of preparation and amount around a participant's uh, willingness and ability to surrender to the experience. So we do find that practitioners who do dose higher, particularly around 100 milligrams plus, generally not holding a lot of faith in their skill sets as a practitioner to be able to offer a different modalities that will allow the participant to feel safer, to feel more comfortable and to feel held through the experience so they can surrender. Because the act of surrender, you know, of course we can force it with more medicine. However, you know, those of us who have been in this, uh, you know, been in this space for many years, we've seen what can happen when forced surrender happens to some individuals. Not everyone's ready for an ego death and that can cause serious psychological harm. So as integration specialists as well, we've seen countless participants reach out to us with drastically awful experiences weeks to months, even years after their, uh, their initial experience. And they may, have, they may have had a blissful experience on the medicine. One of the most common themes we've been seeing in the case studies that we're doing right now um, with participants from all over the world uh, is finding one of the, the main things people wish they had was more preparation. That um, a lot of times they had a blissful experience in the moment, but weeks later, things would start to come up. And many of them, uh, there were some that felt they were having a psycho psychotic break people slipping into meaningless, people slipping into deep depression. Um, yeah, so I would say the people who are speaking about lower sensible doses are also, that is within the context of a full container. When a full container is offered, um, we do see participants surrendering um, quite easier into far less dosages in a much more gentle way. Uh, Hamilton, I don't know if you, you had anything to add on to there. I just wanted to, to grab that one real quick for safety reasons. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a clinician or a facilitator. And so I can see both sides of it pretty well. Like I can understand why somebody might want to 
administer a higher dose to ensure that there is that release and transcendence and not that potentially very anxiogenic low dose experience. But I can also understand that this is this is pretty much the only drug that I would even suggest saying that about because virtually everything else, you always want to start low and work your way up. And in this instance, I think that is still the most responsible thing, but there's a, a little complicating factor, which is how the dose response is really weird and that you have this anxiogenic effect potentially at low doses. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, another question, Hamilton, are there any issues with impurities in synthetic 5-MeO-DMT? Yes. Yeah. There, there is a potential issue with impurities and it's actually been observed. So I presented a process for producing 5-MeO-DMT on my show. It works very well if you do not cool it sufficiently. And this also applies to the synthesis of DMT using the same route. If you don't cool it sufficiently, there is a competing reaction called a pictet spengler reaction, and this produces beta carbolines. So there's actually a published report of someone who is doubtlessly making 5-MeO-DMT using that same process that I described that showed a small amount of the tetrahydro beta carboline impurity. The activity of that particular impurity was studied by Dennis McKenna as a MAOI, and it's very, very weak. So I don't think that in this instance that poses a major risk, especially if it's a trace component, but it's something to be aware of because it's also very difficult to remove these beta carbolene impurities. So you want to um, prevent them from forming in the first place. It's a lucky situation that the particular beta carbolene that is formed is not a potent MAOI because if it were, that could be very dangerous, but this was something that I had uh, considered in advance. It's still, of course, always advisable to do your best to purify materials via either column chromatography or distillation or whatever techniques you have that are available to you. Um, and that's just with reductive emanation. You know, there's different impurities depending on how the 5-MeO-DMT is synthesized. And there are many different ways to make it. I could you know, spend several hours talking about all the different ways to make it, but I think the one that I presented is the easiest one. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Um, there was another question on here from uh, Joe Hassel asking if the molecule is quite stable or do you find it uh, degrades over time? So stability is really often a, a function of storage conditions. Most things are stable if they are stored in a, as a dry powder without exposure to ultraviolet light, ideally without exposure to oxygen. If you can store things under argon, which is what most chemists do, that's ideal, but probably outside of the abilities of most people. But when things are dry, kept away from oxygen and in the dark and in a freezer, most things that most psychoactive drugs that people are interested in are sufficiently stable that they will last lifetimes when stored under those conditions. But if it is stored, you know, in the sun at room temperature, or especially in solution, if things are kept in solution, that tends to reduce stability dramatically. And if they are the free base that can also reduce stability because you can get N oxide um, formation. If it, if it's a salt, you don't have that same risk. So yeah, the, it's just a different, different answers for different storage conditions, but if stored as a base in the dark, under argon, in a freezer, it's gonna be fine forever. Awesome, thank you. And uh, from Phil, and uh, speaking of dark, do you know of any ongoing studies or previous or have any, uh, any understanding around the ability of the body to produce 5-MeO-DMT and or NNDMT in darkness? I am not aware of any studies at the moment on that subject. It seems like that's died down a little bit in recent years. Um, you know, there's someone named Steve Barker who did a lot of really good work on, as well as a woman named Jimo Borjigan who worked with Steve Barker. The two of them did really, really good work on endogenous DMT and what physiological role it might play. I'm not aware of any recent work from them, but they are the two people to look at on that subject because they're kind of the, the major authorities. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. And uh, Psychonaut Marine wants to know if you're gonna do another run of the booklets. 
Uh, I'm working on a different booklet that's about sustainable production of mescaline. So that's the new project is, you know, ways to take any weight off of the threatened peyote population by showing methods to sustainably cultivate peyote and to synthesize mescaline. Beautiful, beautiful. We should, uh, I should actually, let's chat about that later. We have a nonprofit that we're announcing uh, first week of December, but one of our first projects is a, a peyote reforestation project in uh, Wedekuta. And uh, we're working a lot oh, with wow. peyoteros down here and uh, towards that exact cause. It's something of great interest and something that is very unfortunate. You know, you'll see here some of the huicholes will come down from the desert um, to some of the organic markets and stuff and sometimes be selling peyotes. And you'll see that they've uprooted it rather than cutting it off at the base so it can re-sprout. And um, right. so there's an education project one of our brothers is doing up there. But yeah, that's a very important uh, cause. So I'm really glad you're getting that out there. Uh, let's see. Let's see another question. Um, Rain just says, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to share my deep appreciation for your work, Hamilton, and your show. The episodes about oh, cool. 5MEO DMT and the follow-up with the truth, as well as how passionate and logical you are with showing the facts, debunking the myths, and stressing the safety and so important to not just, uh, so important, not just to this compound specifically, but the entire community. So yes, thank you. Oh, wow. We can curl Oh, that's that. nice. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Oh, yeah. And uh, Jackie Tileston, uh, I would like to know what Hamilton thinks of pro of your protocol of self-administered. Um, not 100% sure. What do you think of self low doses, self-administered, um, and then higher full release doses, which sounds awesome, especially for spiritual work? And what about the microdosing of sil uh, silamethoxin? So, um, oh, so yeah, this question was about, was about silamethoxin, which we will have our next talk, December 18th, um, with Ian Benwis, um, the first human to bioassay silamethoxin. So he will be speaking on that uh, next month. And uh, Hamilton, you have anything to add on that one? So I was a little confusing how I read it. <laughs> yeah, so silamethoxin is a new name for 5-MeO4-hydroxy-DMT. So it's a structural hybrid between 5-MeO-DMT and silicin. From a structural perspective, it's about as cool as you can imagine. It's the kind of thing that you, when you, when I was first getting interested in this kind of stuff, it's always like, oh, can I hybridize things and make something that combines the best features of two different structures? Like, can you make 5-MeO LSD? The answer is yes, but it's really hard. And the same is true with 5-MeO 4-hydroxy DMT. It's very, very difficult to synthesize that particular drug. It has been done by a French chemist named Marc Julia, who was a specialist in a lot of very complicated synthetic procedures. And I don't think it's been replicated by anyone since him. And so I've always been very interested in it, but it just seemed like a project that would take months to even hope uh, of you know getting a small amount of product so i never have investigated it. and then the hope everyone always had was what if you can figure out a way to get mushrooms to biosynthesize it using the same enzymes that they use to produce psilocin and psilocybin to oxidize and phosphorylate the four position of 5-MeO tryptamine and then alkylate the nitrogen wouldn't that be cool so i know there's some people working on it I did look at a sample of that material and the, I'll say that the results are not conclusive at the moment. I did not detect it in a, in a first analysis, but I'm going to look again and see if I can find it. Um, and, uh, you know, these things can be difficult to detect for a number of reasons, especially when you don't have an analytical reference. Um, there's no commercial reference of that particular compound. So anyway, very provocative, very cool idea. I'm excited to see how this work, um, how it continues into the future. Yeah, us too. And uh, here's a question from Piazza. Would you know if there is a difference between synthesized versus bufo in regards to stress on the liver, gallbladder, or any other organs of the body? No, there should be no difference between the, I mean, the, this is, this is even, if you look at the history of natural product chemistry and structural elucidation of natural products, one of the things that chemists did was they would try to figure out whatever this chemical was in a plant or a fungus or maybe even a toad, then they would synthesize it. And if they had the same physical properties, that was a layer of confirmation that the material that they found in nature was the same as what they expected the structure was. And the reason that you can do that is because they're identical. If they weren't identical, you wouldn't be able to use synthetic materials to confirm their presence in natural products. Um, really, 
the only difference, if there even is one, and I hesitate to even say this, between a natural product and one that is made synthetically outside of the psychological overlays that are at play when people describe these things is that natural things tend to be ever so slightly more radioactive because of the presence of radiocarbon, because cosmic rays you know, bombard CO2, you get radio CO2, it's taken into plants. And that when they incorporate this into their secondary metabolites, there will be trace quantities of radiocarbon. Uh, this has no pharmacological or toxicological effect whatsoever. But if you had, if you said, name a difference, is there any difference? The difference is the minutely, <laughs> minute amount of radiocarbon that's present in things that are uh, metabolizing CO2 from our atmosphere recently because it decays in anything that is derived from petrochemicals, which is the case for many things that are made synthetically. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. And uh, ah, so Brie is saying, I'm not sure if this was discussed. No, it was not. But uh, do you know what is chemically going on in the brain during spontaneous reactivations with 5-MeO-DMT? Yeah, I predicted that question would come up and I don't have a good answer for it. Um, you know, it's this, I mean, I could I could speculate and give you all kinds of answers. Like, you know, there are 5-HC1A receptors in the hippocampus and it is these uh, postsynaptic 5-HC1A receptors that are thought to be responsible for the amnesia that some 5-HT1A agonists exert. Could their presence in the hippocampus and reactivation and be interrelated in some way? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's been adequately studied. Um, I don't even know with certainty that these reactivations are more prominent with 5-MeO-DMT than they are with other psychedelics, but it seems that people talk about them more. So maybe they are, and it's worth studying. I, I think people will begin to answer a lot of these questions um, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. Um, we uh, we just announced we're do or we're about to announce. Excuse me. Uh, we've teamed up with UCL out of uh, out of London and are beginning research at the Tandava Center here in Mexico in Atapuzlan. So first, we're going to be doing some basic research with 32 point uh, uh, EEG and EKG um, brain scanning during the full experience, etc. One of the next ones we look to pursue um, that we are going to be actively raising funds for the study is researching reactivation. So we'll be doing a similar to a sleep study um for people who are prone to reactivation so we're very excited obviously to figure out what's going on in there and uh yeah it's a big open future on that one all right and let's get one more question and tyler d how does 5meo relate to the amygdala's functioning and occasioning cathartic release does the amygdala fall within the dampening of the default mode network mm -hmm. So no, I mean, I don't know that that's been studied. It sounds like the person asking this question is already sort of familiar with uh, the surrounding literature on the subject. So, you know, check out Google Scholar, see if anyone has published a paper on that particular question of interactions with the amygdala and 5-MeO-DMT and 5-HT1A receptors in the amygdala. I haven't looked to see, but it would be interesting, definitely worth studying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, all right. And then just the last question right here, um, which we can just answer. Uh, are there, and if you know of any as well, Hamilton, are there any local groups to support who are protecting the toads and or raising awareness? And Hamilton, deep, grat deep gratitude for all you do. Um, and I would just love to say, yes, there are. Um, if you go onto the five platform, which we'll post, uh, actually, I don't know if there's a chat that we can post in here, but the five, uh, five MEO dot, uh, education. Um, if you go on the five platform and you go under, I believe it's in resources or giving back one of the, uh, um, no, it's not in resources, but um, yeah, one of the, one of the areas on the five platform does, does have links to projects that are happening in Sonora. Um, Fernando Suarez Black has been doing a lot to really gather the, uh, the Comcac tribe, the Setis, and working with the Yaquis as well to, um, you know, working out what they call fair trade toad. Um, and he's been really trying to get all the different collectors in Sonora to sign on and join best practices for collection. Um, and we will be doing a lot more talking about that and, and kind of promotion or towards their platform over the next few months. So definitely stay tuned. Um, but there absolutely is an effort in that area. Yeah. And for those who are wanting to, to get to the website, it's five-meo.education. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And uh, 
other than that, Hamilton, thank you so much for coming on. It was really, really great to have so you on here. You. Thank you for everything you've done for getting, you know, the word on this medicine out there and bringing sensibility in. You know, it was a, it's been a chaotic few years. And, uh, you know, I was one of the speakers in 2019 at Weback and saw you give your talk. And it was much needed, you know, especially then things were at a fever pitch with differing ideas coming up against each other. And there's just been a lot of unneeded confusion in the 5MEO community. So thank you for bringing clarity. Thank you for everything you've been doing. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thanks thank for coming. So and everyone else, thank you so much for coming. Um, next month, December 18th, we will have Ian Benwees discussing silamethoxin, which we were just discussing, which is maybe ingestible 5-MeO DMT grown through mushrooms by feeding it 5-MeO DMT <laughs> in the substrate. So super cool stuff. Um, every month, we're going to have a different free talk on ranging from topics from the clinical to the mystical. And in an effort to bring a balanced, well-rounded understanding of 5-MeO DMT to the community. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you next month. Ciao, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks again, Hamilton. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.